the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And Signal gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. The 11th Hour. The clock on the black paneled wall read 11 when Lord Hempley, presiding Chief Justice, straightened the folds of his robe, adjusted his powdered wig, and nodded curtly to the prosecuting attorney to open the case for the Crown. To the accused in the prisoner's dock, the time was significant. It was the 11th hour in more ways than one. Everyone in the courtroom knew already that the trial was strictly a British formality that a verdict of guilty was only a matter of time. The prosecution will make it amply clear in terms of evidence that not only is this a crime of murder, but murder of the basest sort, willful, cruel, and premeditated. There is a story behind this crime, gentlemen, a story that had its beginning some weeks ago in Torquay. A war <laughs> It began in Torquay, at one of the lovely resort hotels there, looking down on the white beach and blue water. In a way, it was the 11th hour even then for the man who stepped up to register at the desk. Leslie Garthwaite, Alberta, Canada. Right. Yes, sir. Now, about a room. I want the best there is, Clark. I've been told that this place has the finest accommodation on the south coast. Oh, please don't disappoint me. Oh, of course, Mr. Garthwaite. Uh, boy... Yes, sir. Uh, show Mr. Garthwaite to the ambassador suite. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Garthwaite. If you come a little earlier, sir, but all the tables overlooking the water are occupied. Oh, that's too bad, waiter. I'd look forward to watching the sunset. However, sometimes our guests will consent to sharing tables. Uh, perhaps that young lady dining alone in the far corner. The young lady... Oh, that would be most agreeable. If the lady doesn't mind, I should be delighted. Excellent. Uh, if you'll excuse me, sir, I will consult her wishes. You don't care for tea, Mr. Garthwaite? Oh, I have it on occasion, but not often. Does that shock you? Well, it seems disloyal somehow. You Canadians, I just can't well, understand now, why... Kind, I... When you were so kind as to share your table with me... I didn't realize that we'd be discussing such weighty matters. <laughs> Can't we leave the international problems to the United Nations? You're an unusual person. Is that a compliment? I'm not sure. Perhaps you'd better tell me more about your ranch in Canada. Oh, I warn you, Miss Townsend. I can be a crashing bore on the subject of cattle. And the head waiter's handy in case of emergency. I'll risk it. Proceed, Mr. Garthwaite. You were saying there's more to the care and feeding of a steer than meets the eye. Oh, I could go on for hours. Perhaps days. Oh, please do, Mr. Garthwaite. Very well, Miss Townsend. You're a very skillful conversationalist. 
Or have I said that before? Why so? You prey on feminine curiosity. Oh? Do you realize that it's five days now since you came to Torquay? Oh, quite. And... Five days to the hour. And in spite of my recognized skill at the art of cross-examination, you still remain a man of mystery. Oh, now, see here, that's not fair. Now, I've told oh, you... Oh, yes, that... I know. We've gone into your Canada ranch at great length, touched for a moment on a relative or two in South Africa, oh, well, but... Well, I think that's rather good for five days. But still, you elude me. Like a bug I can't quite impale on a pin. Oh, <laughs> frightening metaphor, to say the very least. No matter. <laughs> Leslie, you see before you a frustrated woman. Thank you, Cynthia. Tell me, Leslie, are you married? Oh, yes, indeed. And who is the... Oh, seven wives, in fact. Three in Canada, two in South Africa, one in Australia, and the other, the uh, youngest one, if I remember, rattling around somewhere in the Malay archipelago. <laughs> Will you be serious? <laughs> are you? Why, I... I... Are you serious, Cynthia? Or is this... I a... don't know, Leslie. I don't know. Two weeks can pass quickly in a place like Torquay with a girl like Cynthia Townsend. Cynthia crossed the table three times a day. Cynthia in his arms in the magic gloom of the dance floor. Cynthia by moonlight in the terrace gardens behind the hotel. And it was bearing down on him now with a two weeks slipping by, with the last day rushing toward him like an express train. When it came, as he knew it must, Cynthia was there too in the compartment of the train that was to take him away. As he looked down at her, the final quality of the moment hit home. It was almost gone now. The eleventh hour was ticking itself out. Well, here we are, Leslie. Yes. We cut it rather close. Twenty-five parts. We, we have a couple of minutes. It seems only a moment ago that we had two weeks. Yes. It did sort of slip by, didn't it? How long are you going to stay in London? I can't tell. I... I have a few things to clear up, and then... Then what? Canada, I suppose. It, it must be lovely in Canada this time of year. Oh, it is. Very lovely. I'll be going back to London in another week, Leslie. You have our address. If by any chance you can oh, manage it... yes, Cynthia, yes, I'll, I'll look you up. I'll, uh, perhaps we'd better run along now. Yes. Well, what do I say? It's been nice knowing you, Leslie. It was a delightful holiday. I hope we'll meet again somewhere, and... Leslie... <laughs> Cynthia, darling. I can't bring it up, dear. I can't be clever anymore. Oh, now, please, dear, I've told you that I can't see you again. I can't let you go off like this, Leslie. But you've got to understand. Tickets, please. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. That's quite all right, Conductor. Uh, Cynthia, you, you've got to go now. The train's about to leave. And... Goodbye, Cynthia. Goodbye, Leslie. Goodbye. Uh, may I have your ticket, sir? Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, I'm afraid you're in the wrong compartment, my man. This here's a third-class ticket. Yes, I'm aware of that. My baggage is back there now. Oh? Why are you here? Oh, never mind, conductor. I'm afraid you wouldn't understand. Yes, it's over now. Back to the third-class compartment. And more than that, back to a third-class life in an upstairs flat in Dover. Leslie Garthwaite is gone, along with those two stolen weeks in Torquay. And you're back to what you were before. Alfred G. Treadle, traveler in men's shoes, married to a dumpy, middle-class woman named Flora. You sit across the table from her now, watching her sip her tea. The tea that has become a symbol of your life with Flora. You wait for the questions you know are bound to come. Your tea's getting cold, Alfred. I said I've had enough, Flora. Why do you keep insisting? Why, Alfred, uh, I just think it's nice to sit down at the table once in a while with my husband. I see so little of you, dear. Oh, let's not go into that again. I'm sorry. Uh, did you have a nice trip? Oh, quite nice, thank you, will you? You haven't told me about the investment. I was waiting for you to ask. Well, it's only natural that I'm concerned, Alfred. After all, it's... It's your money, and there isn't very much of it, as I know, Flora. Well, now, please rest assured that it's soundly invested. But I don't 
understand why you've nothing to show for it. Shouldn't there be stock certificates or, or receipts or something? Yes, I told you there will be eventually. Now, please, let's leave it at that, will you? But 200 pounds is... A... 200 pounds is nothing to the syndicate. Well, it's a lot of money to me. Well, you'll have your pretty green certificates when the time comes. Very well, Alfred. What's the matter, Alfred? Why? You're looking at me so queerly. I'm trying to estimate the number of cups of tea you consume in a year. Oh, that's not very kind. No, I suppose not. I have very little else to do. Home alone, weeks on end, while you're away on trips. Sometimes I wonder what you're doing while you're away. It's very simple. I sell shoes and it's all very exciting. Oh, you needn't be sarcastic. It seems on the few days you are home, you could at least be civil. That 200 pounds is a good part of my life saving. Must you keep hammering away at a 200 pounds? Well, I think it's very odd. But... I've explained it a dozen times if I did it once, Flora. I'm not going through it again. You don't have to raise your voice, Alfred. You know Mrs. Stone downstairs. She's probably listening to every word. Well, that's a landlady's prerogative, and I hope she enjoys it. Good night, Flora. I'm going to bed. <laughs> Yes, Alfred, you're home for a week now between business trips. But as the days pass, you find that only part of you is here in the house with Flora. The rest is with Cynthia, Alfred. She's on your mind constantly. And you're thankful you had the nerve to ask Flora for the money, the investment money, to finance those two last stolen weeks. The eleventh hour, well, there was still a little charm left, still the possibility of romance and excitement and the love of a girl like Cynthia. But you were wrong when you thought you could put it all behind you. Cynthia is there in your mind to stay, Alfred. And by the end of the week, you know you have to go back to her somehow. Have you uh, got the money, Flora? Yes, Alfred. Two hundred pounds. Uh, let's see. Uh -huh. Oh, good. Well, I'm all packed now. I'd better be... This up. will be the last of the money, won't it, Alfred? Well, I hope so. The representative wasn't entirely clear over the phone. I wish you'd let me talk to him. And I, I please try to understand, Flora. There's no talking to anyone until the land is ours. Is that clear? All right, Alfred. I suppose it will have to be this way for the present. With the prologue of The Eleventh Hour, the Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. But now I'd like to have a word with you folks who are new to the West. You've no doubt already discovered that wherever you drive throughout the Pacific Coast states, Signal gasoline is known as the go-farther gasoline. And you've heard me tell how the signal organization has grown from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to almost 2,000 dealer-owned signal service stations serving six western states from Canada to Mexico. Now, isn't it only logical that there must be good reasons for this increasing preference for signal? And there are. I could tell you about the extra efficiency Signal gets from your motor that makes possible not only Signal's famous mileage, but also more thrilling performance for your car. Extra driving pleasure for you. But after all, there's only one way you'll ever really know how good Signal gasoline is. That's by trying a tank full in your own car. Will you do that? My bet is that when you step down on your accelerator and feel that swift signal pickup, that smooth, knock-free signal power. From now on, you too will join the switch to signal. And now back to the whistler. Yes, Alfred, it was desperation that made you decide to lie to Flora, to take her money and run away to Torquay for the most exciting two weeks you've ever known. But there were things you hadn't counted on, things you find you can't forget now as the train takes you to London. 
and the dark-haired girl who knows you only by the name you had engraved on expensive cards, Leslie Gosswaite. Leslie Gosswaite, world traveler, wealthy rancher, adventurer. Somehow you don't care about the consequences now as you dial Cynthia's number from the phone booth in Victoria Station. There'll be a way, some way, to take care of Alfred Treadle and the other life in Dover. The life you forget at the sound of Cynthia's voice. Hello? Cynthia? Yes, who is... Leslie! Leslie, it's you! Yes, Cynthia, it's me. Leslie, you've got to come over. Some friends are here. We're having cocktails. Oh, I, I really wanted to see you alone. Nonsense. They'll love you. And you can meet Father. Please, Leslie, say you'll be here right away. All right, Cynthia. I'll be there right away. <laughs> here he is, darling. Get around now. I'll make it quick, dear. They all practically know you anyway. Oh, I should say so. She's talking nothing else. Clyde Winters, Leslie Garthway, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Weddington, how do you do? the Reverend and Lady Knowles, how do you do? How do you do? Mr. Whitley, how are you? and... How do you do? Oh, there he is. Come in here, Father. I want you to meet Leslie. Oh, how do you do, Garthway? Oh, how do you do, sir? I've certainly been hearing enough about you. Uh, here, let me introduce you to a gin and bitter. Oh, I thank you. Then we'll have a little chat and step out on the terrace away from the excitement. I'd enjoy it very much, sir. <laughs> Yes, Alfred, you'll enjoy it. Because you're enjoying everything about this party at Cynthia's. You fit in. Because everything you say to them is just right. Even the things you say to Cynthia's father out on the terrace overlooking London. <laughs> I suppose you know, my boy, that, that Cynthia's quite uh, in love with you. Oh, your daughter is a very frank person, Mr. Townsend. <laughs> yes, she gets it from me, Leslie. I'll tell you quite bluntly... But I was worried when she came back from Torquay. I, I thought she'd run into another fortune hunter. Oh, I understand. A man in your position has to be careful. Yes, indeed. Of course, when you delayed so long in looking her up, I, I felt relieved. Well, the reason was a simple one, Mr. Townsend. I delayed seeing Cynthia because I, too, must beware of fortune hunters. <laughs> <laughs> I deserve that. <laughs> oh, you're all right, Leslie. Uh, I hope we pass muster with you. Oh, you have, sir. Decided to. Oh, fine. Now, now tell me, uh, where are you staying while you're here? Uh, why, uh, well, I really wasn't able to get anything decent, uh, as a matter of fact. I uh, thought so. Now, say no more, my boy. I've got something for you. Something fitting. Now, a chap we know is vacating the finest suite the Barclay Towers. Now, I can get it for you. The Barclay Towers? Yeah, the most exclusive spot of them all, you know. I'll call them about a lease. Oh, but I... I... Now, 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 now. No thanks. No thanks are necessary, my boy. I'm happy to do it. After all, you may be one of the family someday. But, Flora, you've got to send the money. I tell you, we'll lose every penny if we back out now. No, Alfred. No more money. I'll not do it. It's all our savings. You're being very foolish, Flora. Very. But I won't argue with you on the telephone. I'm coming back to Dover directly. It won't do any good. Oh, never mind. We'll talk about it when I get there. Please, Alfred, don't shout at me. Drink your tea. I don't want any more tea, Flora. I can't sit here idly sipping tea when you refuse to see the loss we face. Mrs. Stone, Alfred. You know she listens to every word we say. Oh, hang, Mrs. Stone. I'm talking about us, Flora. You and me. We can't afford to lose our investment. All right, Alfred. But this is the last time, the very last. You... You give me the money? It's in that envelope on the mantel. <sighs> you intended to give it to me all the time. Yes, I suppose I did. But only because I'm going to London with you this time. What? I said I'm going with you, Alfred. We'll talk to this man together. What man? The one who's making the investments for you. Oh, oh yes, of course. This Leslie Garthwaite. I want to meet him. Leslie Garthwaite? Flora, what are you saying? What, what do you know about, about him? Oh, only that he's the one you're dealing with, Alfred. Oh, there's no use denying it. The last time you were here, you left a card of his in the pocket of your tweed. A, a, a card? A very fancy card, indeed. 
engraved with nothing but that name, Leslie Garthwaite. Except, of course, uh, for the pencil notation. Well, notations? Why, uh... Yes. You'd written the name of a hotel in Torquay. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, well, Garthwaite was going there. I thought I might have to look him up. Torquay, indeed. <laughs> Is he that rich, Alfred, that he can go there? Well, I... I don't know Mr. Garthwaite's habits, Flora. Yet you'd give my money to a man you know so little about. Oh, you needn't worry about him, Flora. I know that much. How do you know? Who is he? What's his background? Where's he from, Alfred? Well, Leslie Garthwaite is a, a very fine man, Flora. You, you must take my word for it. I'll have to, until I get to London and meet him myself. Where are you going, Alfred? Don't walk off when I'm talking to you. You're getting so you don't even care how you treat me. Alfred! <laughs> But you don't stop, do you, Alfred? No. Because if you're with Flora another minute, you're not sure what might happen. So you leave the flat and hurry downstairs, anxious to be outside to get a breath of air. It's just as you're passing Mrs. Stone's door that you hear the words that and send your mind no spinning idea, wildly. Alfred, how he talked to that poor wife of his. No idea at all. I tell you, it's a wonder there hasn't been a murder up there. <laughs> Yes, Alfred, it's a wonder, even to the neighbors. And somehow, that puts a new light on the situation, offers an escape that hadn't occurred to you before. Part of it is clear now. Alfred Treadle is going to murder his wife and flee the country. You walk on, the rest of the plan forming slowly with each step. By the time you reach the Pied Piper Tavern, you know exactly what you plan to do. There will be no covering up. On the contrary, you draw attention to your plan. That's the way I feel, Ollie. I can't help it. I'm sick of it. Tired of the whole thing. Here now, Elf. That's no way to be talking about your missus. You don't know who will hear you or what they'll think. Well, it's the truth, Ollie. I don't care who hears me. I'm going away. I'm going to leave her and go to the continent. I've got my ticket already. The best thing you can do, Elf, is get on home. You've had too much. You don't know what you're saying. All right, Ollie. All right, I'll go home. But just to pack my thing. That's all. Uh, yes, sir? Here, I think that's the right amount. I want a ticket to Calais. One way, sir? One way. Right, oh. She'll be sailing promptly at 10 o'clock, sir. It's just about half an hour. Now, uh, what's the name, please? Treadle. Alfred Treadle. You move away from the ticket window, but not to board the boat. No, Alfred. You haven't any intention of getting on that boat, have you? All you want is to have that clerk remember you so that what he has to say later will match your friend Ollie's testimony. You are going to the continent. You said so in a careless moment. And that's where they'll search for you, somewhere on the continent. Only before they discover Flora's body, the boat will have docked at Calais, and all the passengers will have disembarked. It'll be a long search, won't it, Alfred? And while they're searching, Leslie Garthwaite will be honeymooning in Canada. And it should be a simple matter, Alfred, to make the honeymoon a long one. Yes, the way is clear now, and knowing that you're not your usual self as you return to Flora. Somehow, you find yourself calm, actually polite, and when she offers you the usual cup of tea, you accept it for once without a scene. Even her sniveling self-pity leaves you unruffled. But please, Flora... Don't get too excited. How can I help it? Will you walk out when I'm speaking to you, Alfred? And don't come back till you're ready. Now, Mrs. Mrs. Stone, Flora. I don't care. It's got to stop, Alfred. There's got to be an end to it. There will be. Now, sit down, my dear, and finish your tea. Now, I've told you how happy I am that we're going to London together. You, you haven't been kind to me, Alfred. Things are going to be different, Flora. I promise you that. Yeah, now, you finish your tea and we'll be on our way. I don't want any more, Alfred. If you're finished, we'll leave now. Uh, just as you say, Flora. You turn out the lights and I'll carry the bags downstairs. All right, Alfred. You're coming, Flora? Be right there, Alfred. 
I didn't want to forget anything. Being so nervous and all, I... Oh, now, we must forget that, Flora. You're going to have a pleasant trip. You're... Yes, Mrs. Stone? Well, it's you. Is there anything wrong in a man and his wife going on a little holiday? <laughs> going out together for a change, eh? Please, Mrs. Stone, we... Oh, I think it's nice, Mrs. Treadle. Nice to see you being civil to each other for a change. Oh, now, Mrs. Stone, we, uh, we realize that some of our domestic difficulties might have caused a strain on you and some of the others, but it isn't going to be that way anymore. Alfred's right. There's to be no more quarreling. Not ever. That's right, Mrs. Stone. No more quarreling. Ever. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, I have some surprising facts for you drivers who wonder whether the kind of oil you choose for your motor really makes any difference in the way your car runs. In an actual road test, two identical cars were run over 70,000 miles, one using today's finest straight motor oil, the other using Signal Premium Motor Oil, the new type Signal Lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with five scientific compounds. When these motors were torn down for inspection, the one using Signal Premium Oil had only one-sixth as much carbon deposit and one-third less cylinder wear. So what does this mean to you? Well, less carbon means that your motor runs quieter, smoother, and less cylinder wear means more power. Good reason, I'd say, for making your next oil change a change to this new type signal oil. It's your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the whistler. <laughs> Yes, the verdict in the murder trial taking place in the courtroom of the Old Bailey was a foregone conclusion. The judge, the jury, the spectators, and most important of all, the prisoner, shifting restlessly in the dock, knew it from the moment the trial began. But there was a moment of real excitement when the accused finally took the stand, when the counsel for the Crown finally asked the one all-important question. Will you answer that question? Yes or no? He took all my money, and he was going to run off to Calais and leave me. So I did it. I put the poison in Alfred's tea. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday at the same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Ben Wright and Esther Mason. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone and Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>